Hi everybody, Pastor Scott here. This is the Sunday School video for Mother's Day, uh, May 10th, uh, 2020, and I hope that you're well. And as I just uh, stated in the uh, sermon video a little while ago, which you'll probably watch uh, after you watch this, I just want to wish you a happy Mother's Day. We love you very much, and we, we hope that you uh, just have a blessed day today. I know that we're in kind of strange times that make uh, holidays uh, seem a little bit different than they usually are. And uh, usually what I would say is I hope that you get to spend some time with your family, but over the last two months you've been spending a lot of time with your family probably. Um, because of all that, I know that it's, it's just kind of a strange time, but I do hope that as much as it's possible that you have a blessed and wonderful Mother's Day and, uh, and you know that we love you. And, uh, but we want to talk about Acts again this morning. And like I mentioned uh, last week, I wanted to give attention to really the last kind of third of the book of Acts, uh, because we've really looked at the first two thirds kind of in depth uh, over the course of the last, I think, five or six months, actually. But I, I've never actually myself dug heavily into um, Acts 20 and on. So that's what we want to do here for at least the time being as we look through the book of Acts in Sunday School. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I wanted to kind of do some introductory work this morning preparing us for what we see as the narrative of Acts shifts toward Paul's kind of journey to Rome and his trial that he's going to be going through. And I know that the Lord's going to bless that as we do that. Look at this section that, that kind of gets passed over uh, in the book of Acts. So uh, what we want to do in the way of introductory work, first thing we want to notice here is that Paul is on his third missionary journey. And he is a missionary who has been supported by the church in Antioch in much the same way, <clears throat> maybe not exactly the same way, but in some similar ways to the fact that we have missionaries whom we support as a church. And we're very happy to do that. And we love them. And it really just gives us a sense that we're participating in global ministry because we are. And it really should give us a sense of, of godly pride uh, over that to, to pray for and partner with uh, these missionaries whom we love. So in a similar way, Paul is a missionary supported by the church in Antioch. And uh, he's been out on several missionary journeys very clear that he is a called and special man in the early church. And now he has entered, uh, he's, he's gone out on his third missionary journey from Antioch. And we see that in chapter 18, verse 23. Um, he lands at Caesarea, went up and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch. And after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next to the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, right after that, he's going to go to Ephesus. But so he goes back to Antioch uh, after his second missionary journey is over. And he stays there for a little while, gets strengthened, uh, spends some time with the uh, disciples there, it says in verse 23. And then he goes right back out. Here's a man who uh, is just, uh, he's just going with the wind. You know, he wants to be out there strengthening the disciples, uh, making sure that the church is built up and strong in the gospel. That's what Paul is giving himself to. And uh, as this is happening, what we're going to notice here is friction in Paul's ministry. And friction is not something that is new to Paul, and it's certainly not something that's new to the work of the gospel in the book of Acts. Indeed, if we can sort of uh, draw a parallel between just the whole story of Acts and then uh, on one side and Paul's personal ministry on the other side, we see first, the first place of friction is with the Jewish world as the message of Jesus and the redemption that comes in him is preached in the Jewish world. There's friction between it and, and Jewish religiosity in particular. Um, and it's, it's not as though the Jewish people don't love God. It's not as though they don't have a zeal for God. Even Paul says in Romans 9 that, that they have a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. That is to say that they have a zeal for God and the things of God and godliness, but they, they don't really know the Lord. They've been living in religion, and uh, they've been um, elevating the importance of what God has done and what God has said in the past, but they don't really know him personally. And the gospel comes along and says, who Jesus is, is what God is like. 
He's the radiance of the glory of God. And the exact imprint of his nature, as the writer of Hebrews says, he is the image of the invisible God, as Paul says in a couple of his letters. This is what God is like because Jesus is no less than the second member of the Trinity. They wouldn't say it like that necessarily, but he's the son of God. And to say this is what God is like and to say that you need to repent, that the message of believing in him as your righteousness for salvation, and that's supposed to go out to the nations and not just stay with us, that is such an offensive thing that it creates friction with the Jewish people. We see that in Paul's ministry um, here as we enter into this sort of last third of the book of Acts as well. But not only is it creating friction with the Jewish world, we also see it begin to create friction within the non-Jewish world as well. As the message goes out from Judea, away from Jerusalem, and now it's centered in Antioch, and it goes into these other areas of Asia and Europe and all of that, there's a great, you know, kind of friction between the message of the gospel and the, and the Gentile world around there. And not only that, but also with the religiosity of the Gentile world as well. You might remember that in Acts 17, when he goes to Athens, um, he, the first thing he says when he preaches to them, he says, Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. And he uses that as his access point to preach Christ. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. And then he preaches the gospel. But notice, Athens would not be a city that's regarded as a, as a heavily religious city. It's a center of philosophy and academia, but it is indeed religious. They are religious. They do have altars. They do believe in the gods and all of that. And so Paul comes and he confronts that with the word of Christ. And he even uses this, this um, altar that he saw that had to the unknown God as an access point. Let me proclaim to you this unknown God because I know him. And not only does it happen there in Acts 17, but it also happens over in Acts 19 um, in, when he's in Ephesus and the gospel is confronting the temple of Artemis. Um, which, uh, which we'll get to here in just a little bit. But the point is that gospel faithfulness will always, always find backlash. There will always be friction everywhere that it goes. And it's not just because it's a new message and it takes new messages a while to catch on and people are comfortable, so it's going to take a while, generations even, for it to have an effect. It's not just because of that, but it's because it claims Jesus' lordship. It claims that Jesus is Lord of all and that any other narrative of transcendence or absoluteness, that is to say any other narrative of, of origins, transcendent, you know, gods and standards and things being true or false, any other narrative has to be judged now in light of what the resurrection of Jesus says about him. And Paul says all of this other stuff is unknown and is it can't deliver i'm proclaiming to you the one who really has delivered and the one who really can deliver and that's creating friction for paul he's already been stoned to, um, not to death you know stoned until they thought he was dead back um where was that i think it was right outside of Lystra in chapter 14 he's already been stoned he's going to take on more and he's going to enter into this trial because this message is just so offensive in chapter 18, when he goes into Corinth, um, there's a situation there when he first goes into the synagogue, and it seems like right after he goes there and there's a lot of friction that he wants to leave. Be, he wants to leave the area because he uh, because there's such a um, there's such a backlash. In verse six, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. In verse six, so it seems like he wants to leave, but it tells us that uh, there were some who heard Paul and were baptized. In verse 9, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God there. So Paul wanted to leave, and then the Lord appeared to him in a vision, strengthened him, and said, There are many people who are my people who are going to listen to the message, and um, you are going to be saved. 
So after he stays there, when he, when he has stayed there, we find in verse 12, the Jews making this united attack on Paul and bringing him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. And as Paul's about to speak, Gallio, the, the proconsul, um, who, by the way, he's an interesting guy, actually. He's a historic figure. Uh, he is Seneca's brother. And if you know anything about uh, ancient Roman philosophy, there's ancient Greek philosophy within the Greco-Roman world, um, you, you might have heard of Seneca. Seneca was a major writer, a major philosopher in the first century. Uh, he was a friend of Emperor Nero in the first uh, four or five years of his reign. Um, we, he's wrote a lot of very valuable stuff to understanding the first century world for us today. But anyway, Seneca is there, and his brother Gallio, the proconsul here, he listens to the Jews bringing this charge against Paul, very similar to the Jews bringing a charge against Jesus in Jerusalem uh, earlier on. And he says to them, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. It's very interesting to me how Gallio... Um, views the dispute as being something that is just a question about words, names, and law. Um, and indeed, the message of the gospel does have to do with words, names, and law. Words like resurrection, repentance, faith in Christ, justification, uh, temple, kingdom, all of these things, that's, these are elements of Paul's preaching. Names, the idea is that Jesus is the son of David, the seed of Abraham, uh, and your law. Paul's message is that the law kills um, and Jesus brings to life. But um, Gallio is, is spiritually hardened so that he doesn't see this as, as something that's really worth his time. Um, just like Pilate wanted to, um, wanted to skirt their... Uh, issue with Jesus. He didn't really want to deal with it very much. So point is that you're just seeing a lot of friction here as Paul is preaching and as uh, the message is going out to different places. Now chapter 19, moving on here, chapter 19 is pretty interesting. Um, Paul is going to be in Ephesus and Ephesus is a major, major city uh, in the Roman Empire. It's got about a quarter of a million people in it. Kind of an interesting history. It was in one place, but because of issues with its water supply, it had to move to another place. And uh, like I said, a quarter of a million people, huge city at that time. In Ephesus, in verses 1 to 6, has disciples there. Uh, but the problem is that they're confused because they say um, that they were baptized into John's baptism and didn't know that there was a Holy Spirit. Um, and the reason why they think this is probably because at the end of chapter 18, Apollos of Alexandria, who was a very gifted preacher, preached to them this kind of half gospel, not telling them about the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting to me that Apollos isn't looked on more negatively um, because he, he, he preaches really just a half gospel. But Luke doesn't look on him more negatively, probably because he was doing his very best, he was gifted, and then he takes the corrections of Priscilla and Aquila. But nevertheless, he leaves some people who are really only have a half understanding of things until Paul goes there and says to them that uh, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, and that is Jesus, and then they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Paul fills out this half gospel that they know. Now secondly, right after that in chapter 19, the, his ministry moves from the synagogue into a public place known as the Hall of Tyrannus. And uh, that is a um, that is an actual historic place. It's actually not just a hall, but it's a it's a building that's part of a school, the school of Tyrannus, and it is a very very public place. Paul is getting such a following in Ephesus that people are just showing up all over the place uh, to listen to him and to hear him preaching. He uh, he's in the synagogue first in verse eight, persuading and reasoning about the kingdom of God, but they continue in unbelief. So he goes to the Hall of Tyrannus, reasoning daily, and that continued for two years. Huge ministry, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Paul is becoming a famous, famous figure um, at this point in Ephesus. Thirdly, 
um, in chapter 19, the sons of Sceva. You might be familiar with the story. They're Jewish exorcists. They're casting out. Um, they're casting out demons. Let me see here. Bear with me. God was at the time was doing miracles by the hands of Paul. That's kind of the big picture. <clears throat> and um, there were Jewish exorcists who were even because of this invoking the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Um, even though they don't believe they're invoking the name of Jesus. But if you read that little section there, um, some of the demons, they're, uh, they're responding to evil spirits, say to them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, because earlier the sons of Sceva were saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them, um, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Um, and this tells us here that the fear fell upon them all in the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Uh, and even and there were believers who came to came to faith because of this. And it's very interesting just how this kind of this strange story, at least to our ears as Westerners, happens. And this is 